Oh, we got a lot of bats. Some landowners are going to bat for these misunderstood mammals. We are the confluence of the greatest river system in North America, and flooding is part of our history. Enough is enough. Some new and creative solutions to Midwest flooding threats. We're all used to festivals celebrating food or flowers. How about fires? You burn to increase wildlife habitat. Maintaining a healthy forest ecosystem requires pollinators, prescribed fires, and these longtime pals. We want to have as many productive forests as we can. And these scientists are also a forest's best friend. They're making better fertilizers for a more sustainable future. We'll spread our wings across this American land, starting right now. Hello and welcome to This American Land. I'm your host, Ed Arnett. We've got some great stories for you today about the conservation of America's natural resources, our landscapes, waters, wildlife, and the people that are dedicated to conservation across the country. We'll begin today in rural Pennsylvania, where private landowners are working with federal government support to preserve mature forest habitats that are essential for wildlife, including threatened populations of bats. I'm Tom, and this is my wife, Wendy. I own 1,313 acres here in Blair County, Pennsylvania. We've had its perks, you know, being able to just live up here, and we used to camp all the time. We never go camping anymore because we camp every day, I think. Our favorite part is sitting on the back porch when the peepers first come out. You're close to towns. For us, it takes us 15 minutes, but yet we still have the luxury of being out in the country and in the wild. How long have you noticed the bats? under the porch here and around the house. First couple times I'd seen it, I looked, and I'm like, there's no bats in there. I kept looking, and there's no bats. Then I'd, I'd listen, I'd hear them, and, go, meep, meep, meep. and I'm like, there's bats in there. I can never find them. They're so small. So are all bats threatened? So in, in Pennsylvania, we have, we have two federally listed species. So we have the Indiana bat, which is federally listed as endangered, and then the northern long ear bat, which is federally threatened. This is the aerial photo of my property. There's a well-known cave, the Hartman Mine Cave. Lots and lots of bats winter there. It's called a hibernacula. There's probably about a mile and a half as a crow flies from where they roost inside my house to the cave. We're gonna look at an area that we did some herbicide spraying. I really enjoy white-tailed deer hunting. I manage this property. I've been managing for 20 years with quality deer management, doing the same thing we're doing with the bats, to grow better quality white-tail herds. That's my passion, that's my love. So this is a dead barberry. I sprayed them two years ago and they've all died, allowing other stuff to grow. How big is the cave, I mean, in general? It's a pretty large uh, mine. When we do our bat surveys, a lot of times we need binoculars to identify the bats. How many bats do you think are in there, roughly? The last full survey we had was 2015, and we only counted a little over 70 bats. Wow. Which is a dramatic decline, considering the site used to have over 32,000 bats at one point in wow. time. Wow. How long ago was that? This area got white nose in 2012. White nose syndrome is a disease affecting bats um, all up and down the northeast coast of the United States. This fungus was brought inadvertently by cavers visiting Europe. And what we saw was a 99% decline in some of our most common species, one of them being the little brown bat that we'll see here tonight. So it's about 8 p.m. now, and the bats are just starting to wake up for the evening. And what we have here is some, a maternity colony of female little brown bats, and they're uh, roosting here on the property. Hopefully, we will see some bats emerging. The property is really important to the federally endangered Indiana bat. So in cooperation with the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Game Commission, and DCNR, we met with Mr. Belinda and walked his property and due to the proximity to Canoe Creek State Park and Hibernacula, 
and known maternity colonies decided this would be a good spot for permanent easement to specifically manage for bats. We were able to work with NRCS through the Healthy Forest Reserve Program to permanently protect over 800 acres of Mr. Belinda's property for the benefit of Indiana bats. I do know some other large landowner friends of mine, and they said I was an idiot for getting the federal government involved in my properties. I look at it, why not use them as an asset instead of an enemy? He has a Japanese barberry problem on the property. It inhibits regeneration of the highly desirable species that we're looking for. So he was provided with um, financial assistance to come out and spray Japanese barberry and other invasive species on the property. They like this area, the bats, because almost every tree you see that's larger than your thigh is a tree species that is of high concern that's good habitat. For instance, you look over there and see an elm tree. As the tree matures, they tend to get those types of bark characteristics that the bats like, and they can just creep right under those crevices and find some place warm. Yeah, yeah, so typically the older the tree, the more nooks and crannies and habitat it's gonna offer. But as part of forest health management, you need those younger age classes coming up to support the next generation of forest and future generations of bats as well. Hopefully, we had bats emerge about 15 minutes ago. At this point, I'm hoping that we caught a couple bats that we can process. Oh, we got a lot of bats. A lot of the white nose scarring should be pretty well healed up. It shouldn't be as visible as when they first emerged from hibernation, so this bat looks fine. This is such a time that these organisms need our help. If you can imagine, when they used to trap Canoe Creek, this entire basket would be full of bats. They'd just be literally scooping bats out. OK, female, little brown adult. It's a great time to bring both the private and public together and really have everyone pull together to try and help save bats right now. Yep, there he goes. It's just been awesome to be able to drive up the lane every day and realize that you can be a steward of something great. There are bats that have found some way to adapt, so it's really a treat to, to recapture some of these bats. Humans have always settled along rivers for fresh water, growing their crops, and for recreation and the sheer beauty. But they've also dammed and developed many areas that are now prone to dangerous flooding. How do we break the costly cycle of flooding, cleaning up, and then rebuilding? We take you now to St. Louis, Missouri, on the Merrimack River, where innovations and more natural solutions to flood mitigation are leading to many benefits for people who live along the river. You've got a trash can there. You've got some debris from wooden docks. And pretty much all of this was deposited from this winter's flood. It's amazing how a river can transport a whole building like this downstream, I don't know how far, and then just set it down on shore and back away from it. We had a really big flood this past December through early January. The river rose about 35 feet. When we're talking about the Merrimack Greenway and trying to establish it, that's one of the things we hope for, is that we're able to help people who've been flooded. From a conservationist standpoint, one that's interested in, in keeping the Merrimack River real biodiverse, yeah, I, I think it's a, a great way to achieve two things. Number one, get people out of harm's way. And, and secondly, when the, the land right next to the river reverts to a more natural state, it allows that portion of the land to, uh, to kind of absorb some of the flooding impacts that take place. And hopefully that helps reduce the quantity and size of the flooding for people and businesses downstream. I'm Kevin Mino, a fisheries management biologist for the Missouri Department of Conservation. But there's a lot of other folks who just, you know, time in and again and again have gotten flooded and they're just sort of tired of it. They know that the federal regulations have really clamped down a lot on how much, you know, you can kind of keep getting assistance to rebuild. I'm thinking that the water impacted 
up to at least this level. And I'd say we're probably 16 to 18 feet off the ground right here, so I'd say it was probably up 24, 25 feet above ground level. It was one of the worst floods we've had on record. As the flooding has come, more and more people have turned to us and asked for a buyout or were happy to sell us their property. Then after doing the calculations and coming to grips with their fiscal situation, they realized to get a building permit and to uh, reoccupy this house again, it just can't be done. We saw some uh, family photographs over there. I'm sure there's some evidence of frustration in the sale too, in the sense that they couldn't get back to this house to get the things out that were very personal to them at the time that it was flooding. It was a sad situation, but that's how fast it can happen. We are the confluence of the greatest river system in North America. So obviously we have the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Merrimack here. And flooding is part of our history. So Great Rivers Greenway was created in 2000 by the voters here in the city of St. Louis, St. Louis County, St. Charles County, and it was the Clean Water, Safe Parks and Community Trails initiative at the time. So the idea from the very beginning of, of the formation of Great Rivers Greenway was to look at how we could connect all of our natural areas, our green spaces, but also look at it from a clean water standpoint as well. We are one of the few park districts in the United States that's actually formed on a sales tax basis. My name is Todd Antoine. I'm the director of planning and projects for Great Rivers Greenway District here in St. Louis, Missouri. The River Ring is a whole idea of looking how we can connect all the communities throughout St. Louis, looking at our major rivers. It's really good for the St. Louis region and for cities around the world um, to have that mixture of folks there out there engaging with each other in the natural environment. So we're here on the Merrimack River today. It's a stream that uh, goes from very rural parts of Missouri down into very urban parts of St. Louis City. Um, the river itself is facing a lot of challenges. It's a very important resource for our region. So when we come out for Operation Clean Stream, which is our you know, big two-day, 500-mile uh, river restoration project on the Merrimack and its tributaries, we get to interact one-on-one -on -one with people from rural and urban areas. There you go. With Great Rivers Greenway District, the Open Space Council partners to work along the Merrimack River, along some of the Merrimack Greenways, the bike and pedestrian trails, to really steward them, to make them healthy riparian zones, uh, to build you know, healthy forests, and to make sure that erosion along the, the river banks and the creek banks uh, isn't continuing. Um, and also just to create beautifully, aesthetically valuable spots for local citizens to recreate. The volunteers from AmeriCorps are out with us today helping us restore habitat at Rauk Elva, and they'll be out here for a few more weeks. Great Rivers Greenway has been acquiring these parcels um, after recent flooding events. Um, when the homeowners have chosen to not restore or rebuild their homes, they've turned them over for the sake of public green space preservation. So since this property hasn't been actively managed um, in recent years, it is degraded to some degree. We're clearing honeysuckle from a Greenway corridor. Um, it's right on the Merrimack River. We're just here to take out the invasives so that the natives can grow back. We want to open up the canopy. We want light to get through. We want to see the river. And then we're going to go back and replant with the native trees, the native shrubs, and the native grasses and forbs that would have belonged on this site historically and kind of manage it as the natural system that nature intended. People really care about the world around them. They want to get involved. And so they're seeing that land transform from an untidy, polluted place to something that becomes beautiful and very clean. So now they can go back time after time and see that they made a difference in that community. They're improving the health of that watershed. And we have about 117 miles of trail on the ground right now. We're a sixth of the way there. We're really here for the preservation and expansion of the Merrimack Greenway and removing people and property out of harm's way where we see constant and repetitive flooding. So we're happy with that success and each year we pick up more and more as owners get frustrated or just come to a place where it's time to turn it over. So we're really close to having the connectivity we need to really build this out as a full trail and greenway. Fire is an important management tool for healthy landscapes.
prescribed fire is used to manage forests and grasslands, making them more productive and resilient for agricultural producers, while also benefiting a variety of wildlife. Historically, fires burned through prairies of the Great Plains and the pine savannas of the southeast, and the plant communities of those ecosystems developed with periodic natural fires. Prescribed fires reintroduce this process, resulting in healthier ecosystems for wildlife, as well as better forest and ranching operations, as we can see in this story from Jackson County in the Florida Panhandle. We're standing in the corner of Market Street in Caledonia, in, in Maryland, Florida. Five days a week, I go for breakfast at the gazebo. I'm Willie Earl Paramore from Jackson County, Florida. I want you to think of number one through five. And one I, and through five. Tell everybody what the number was. Three, OK, four. Four. <laughs> Bunch of guys meet, and we have one room set aside for us. I planted the eggplant, and, and I could not get any fruit. I told Willie Earl about it. He said, what you need is some bees. We had a uh, pair of horse farmers said they come by every day just to aggravate people. Tupelo's what sells the best. Everybody likes Tupelo here. It's sweeter. And the high humidity, the bees are very aggressive for, for some reason. You better move back. OK. <laughs> I'll see it be there. <laughs> I'm Mary Jane Nelson. I am a district conservationist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Jackson County, Florida. We're on Willie Earl Paramore's 540 acres that he's been working with the agency for many years to help maintain um, a healthy forest ecosystem through the prescribed burning process. I burned this in November. Right. And these warm days that come up about this high, that's ideal food plot for deer and turkey. There's a deer track. Mr. Paramore is um, inspirational in that he is still getting out here for the benefit of the wildlife, but also for the benefit of his community and his family. That's my son there. Hey! Are all the bees doing all right? Oh, yeah, they do. And the legacy that he will leave, but it's difficult to keep up with Mr. Paramore. He likes to burn. You burn to increase wildlife habitat. If you burn on a regular basis, you will not have wildfires. When people find out why we burn, and they, they've seen enough news stories, they've seen enough catastrophic fires, that they understand that this is a way of ensuring that that doesn't happen to them. My name is Kevin Hires. I'm a wildland fire scientist here at Tall Timbers Research Station. Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the Red Hills Fire Festival. This is a celebration of prescribed fire, an opportunity for the public to see all the ways that, that fire is set. Tall Timbers was established as a research station in 1958. And being able to connect the application of fire to the long-term management goals of conservation in the region. All you're gonna have to do is put your wick in the fire. This is Tyler. She's a lucky winner, and she's actually gonna light fire for the first time today. The fire is now burning slowly. We, we call that backing. Occasionally get a little wind shift, and it'll flare up. If I were to tell someone something about the benefits of prescribed burns, I would tell them that um, it helps prevent larger fires from happening that aren't controlled by professionals. Fire is part of the natural forest system uh, that brings both economic return and biodiversity to the landscape. My name is Kevin McGordy. I'm director of the Tall Timbers Land Conservancy. Just as rain is and uh, water is, is and river systems are, fire is, is intrinsic. It's taken a long time from the days of Smokey and the concept of uh, all fires in the forest are bad to today, wildfires in the forest are bad. For 
prescribed burning is, is critical to the health and well-being of that forest system. One of the neat things about burning, and a part that is a misconception with most of the public, is they think that we're actually killing the plants when we burn them. And we're not. We're actually just killing the above ground portion. We call that top kill. Within a week or two, this will be around two to four inches high, depending on the rainfall that we get. Within a month, it'll be six to eight uh, inches tall. Sometimes you hear that species are fire dependent, and what that means is that without the use of regularly applied prescribed fire, they basically go away. I'm Bill Palmer. I'm the president and CEO of Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy. And the reason is because the plant community in which they live, their houses, if you will, are developed with how the plants respond to the fire. Bobwhite quail is a very important indicator species for the health of pine ecosystems. We put uh, radio colors on the birds so that we're able to track them. As you know, bobwhite have declined precipitously in the southeastern U.S. I think in 1962, there was over 3 million quail harvested in the state of Georgia and Florida. Today, less than 100,000. So we've done a lot of research on trying to understand the limiting factors. Uh, the need for frequent fire and reasonable open pine canopy to let sunlight reach the ground. Uh, without those two components, quail won't exist. We've been working with Tall Timbers for 10 or 15 years, um, doing prescribed burning and doing uh, habitat manipulations, specifically planting longleaf pine in areas that were needing more forest cover. We're helping to get the area back into a more natural condition by helping them afford this type of management. As Broom says, the quail like to make nests in this stuff. What was your goal? To have it burn clean, have it look like a park. Please, come out. And it keeps the, the animals coming back. It keeps animals coming back. <laughs> and the trees grow better. My big uh, timber sale will be when I'm 98 years old, so we plan to have a big party. Uh -huh. With or without me. <laughs> <laughs> The commercial timber industry is highly competitive and it's collaborating with universities and governments to find ways to commercially grow forests more productively and sustainably. In one approach, scientists are developing slow release fertilizers that are easier on the environment. In our Science Nation report, Miles O'Brien takes us to where this is happening in North Carolina. As money makers, trees stand tall. The U.S. forest industry is an economic powerhouse. Southern states alone grow more commercial wood than any country in the world. We get really important things from forests. Timber products, we get paper products, we get building materials, we get furniture. With population growth, forests are, are being squeezed, are being threatened. With support from the National Science Foundation, the Center for Advanced Forestry Systems is looking to take forestry science to the next level, bringing together universities, industry, and state and federal agencies. The center is working to make commercially grown forests more productive and sustainable. We are always hoping to produce faster growing trees with really good wood that make a very good uh, economic return. This study is actually comparing three different kinds of fertilizers. Forester Tom Fox at Virginia Tech and North Carolina State University tree physiologist Barry Goldfarb have teamed up through the center to study how new slow-release fertilizers could improve growth and be easier on the environment. This is nitrogen where we generally look at N14 and N15. They're tracking the movement of nitrogen signatures from the fertilizer as they spread through the forest. It's also possible that those enhanced efficiency fertilizers will cycle through the ecosystem longer and give us a longer response. So instead of having to fertilize once every five years, we maybe fertilize once every 10 years. The idea is to keep the fertilizer out of the water. Excess nutrients in water uh, can lead to uh, algal blooms, 
and decrease water quality. They also want to better understand forest's role in storing carbon. We're very concerned with climate change, and actively growing forests actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we want to have as many productive forests as we can. What we talk about is the, the services that a forest can provide to society. It is the w clean water that comes from a forested watershed. It's the carbon that the forest can sequester. It can also be just the aesthetics of the forest where people like to hike and walk through the forest. Compared to a lot of crops, trees are slow growers. Getting to the roots of how to best manage them will take years. But these guys are confident that some good old fashioned teamwork will speed up their efforts. Knock on wood. Now here's a look at some stories from our next show. We actually lowered our costs and increased our production by working in sync with Mother Nature. Following nature's lead is good for the earth and the bottom line. These are the places that define America. And outdoor recreation brings joy and jobs to millions, as well as fresh water and a place to soothe the soul. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on This American Land. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org and like us on Facebook.